Um, I've been playing around with um, looking for power line noise for uh, for some time because I, the location I live in in Seaford, um, it started off having a. It, it, it was always 20 over 9, so any, anything below 10 megs was impossible to work. So I thought, I'll oh, stuff this, I've got to get out and have a go. Not all, not all the noise that um, w was all um, as a result of um, arc, you know, direct arcing and, and so on, which produces broadband RF. A lot of it was associated with corona. And when, when you get um, corona across uh, a fault, something like a faulty insulator or a, a fitting, um, you, you, it's when the E-field gets to a critical level, it'll actually flash over. And what it does, it ionises the airspace around. Now, if you wander around at night, often you can, you can look up a pole and you can actually see it. And a good pair of binoculars is also a a handy tool if you're walking up and down the street looking for noise sources. And it's, if you go, there's a site called um, sigwiki.com and on that website there are all these, all these, all these different um, sounds of RF noise and so on and what, what they're likely to be. So if you're trying to hear what Corona sounds like, go to Sigwiki and have a, have a look at the website. But it sounds like Fry, frying chips in a fry pan. That's basically what it sounds like. And what this receiver does is it down converts from 22 kilohertz to 44 kilohertz. And I use a, um, an NE triple five as the local oscillator in, into a FET mixer, and that gives me a signal in the audible range, which we'll give you a listen to shortly when Ian fires up his little box out there. Okay, now there are some standards related to all this stuff for power line companies, and uh, CISPA is our international standards mob, and uh, the stuff for RF measurement they're on um, CISPA six, uh, 16 and 17. So there's about like 156 pages if you want to read each of the standards about what power line companies are supposed to do in terms of meeting standards for. For noise and so on, so it's on those uh, those two documents. If you're driving around your car, and you like, I, li I listen to the lo um, the local radio station down here on on 531, and I found that that's listening to that station driving around where I I live. Um, I drive around the streets, and all of a sudden, I get receiver blocking, and what is it? It's power line noise. So I get out. In my little old box, and I pointed up the vault. Sure enough, there it is. So I reckon I could drive around Melbourne with my GPS, with my man overboard function, and just plot all these spots where all the peaks and and troughs are. Some golden rules about where where do I start? How do I look for this stuff? Um, start with an old with an AM radio uh, or radio on AM. Use Ian's little DF loop and go for a go for a walk. Um, every, every noise source has a signature and this is what we were talking about earlier on, keeping a log. What does it sound like? How often does it occur? Is it day and, is it daytime? Is it night time? Is it start at 6 in the morning and go to 11 o'clock at night or does it come on at 6 o'clock at night and go off at 11 o'clock at night? So all these things are very important to put in a log if you want to characterise the particular type of interference. Um, in talking to Drew Diamond, um, he's found noise sources up to 15 kilometres away from his house. And so how do you go about this? Well, if you've got to, um, you start off low and keep going up. Now, the noise, so the noise doesn't change with received frequency. It's always, the signature of that noise source always stays the same, no matter what frequency you're listening on or you can detect it on uh, as a result of the harmonic, particular harmonic you might be listening to. So the higher the frequency you can use when you're searching, the better, because that means you can get in closer. So if you can hear it on 70, go for it on 70 and go look for the thing. Okay, so 
if you're getting close to a power pole and you've, you've got your boom and you're pointing up there and the thing's as noisy as all hell and you turn it that way and it's not, so you walk down to the next pole and you go back, take a bearing, yes, it's that pole, walk on the other side of the pole and do the same thing back so that you get it from 180 degrees of um, different in, difference in direction so you can confirm it's that pole. Once you get the pole, right, the, right the, every pole has got a metal strip on it with an ID number. So you can actually note that down and you need that information when you're talking to the power companies. So I've got my little ultrasonic receiver. I might get Ian to turn on his noise source. So, I thought, OK, I'll, I'll put this thing together. How am I going to find a parabolic reflector? This parabolic reflector has a, an FD of um, 0.2, exactly what I needed. Guess what it is? My missus wanted a new wok, and I went to, to Ikea, and I looked at this thing, and I said, I'll buy you a new wok, but you can't have the lid. <laughs> There it is. <laughs> and the, this little microphone that's sitting in the middle is a parking sensor off the back of a, a standard motor car. And Mr. J car sells them. And I just, how, how, did I, how did I work out the focal point? Got a torch, didn't I? Just moved down there until, until I could see the, the spot focused up on the bottom of the microphone and that's how I set it up. I can certainly hear it. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> I've got lots of other little tools that I use in which you might have you may have seen these things around. This is a little field strength meter that I use in my caravan so that I can locate the TV station at the um, you know, local TV station when I go camping. But there are some simple tools. Look, look, just a simple little portable AM radio set on the bottom end of the band. You can walk around the street with that because most of them have got a loop stick in it and suddenly it's directional. And that'll, that'll get you within 20 or 30 metres of, of the offending source. This is a bit more sophisticated one. This is actually for measuring the quality of, and field strength of local TV stations. And then I, can, then I can select a spectrum display and I can go from 37, 37 um, megs to 900 megs on this and you get a, a, a very nice little uh, spectrum display, just hang on, I'll, so there's a bit of, there's no antenna on that, but there's a bit of crap around here at the moment, and uh, so I'll pass that round and you can have a, have a bit of a look. All right, the other thing that, that I, I've used with, uh, with a loop antenna is one of the old analog uh, TV signal monitors. I don't know if you've seen these things, but, um, and they've got a built-in attenuator on them, so I can, uh, I can uh, attenuate the, the signal, and uh, I'll just stick a whip on it, and fire it up. There it is. That's what you're listening to out, that, that's, that's Ian's little spark gap going hell for leather. If you put a loop on it, obviously it becomes directional, but it, that's what it sounds like. All right. So, um, sometimes these 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 were designed for when we had analog TV. So, but there's few of these still thing around. People think they're useless. Guess what? Best search tool you'll ever find. Okay, that's pretty much uh, what I want to talk about. Okay.